Good morning, Frank. Good morning, Henry. Very good to see you. And um, so glad having you again in this very critical time. And we're all thinking of you and the people of Ukraine. Thank you, Frank. Yes, obviously, this is not the best time for the country. It's not uh, the best time, but, um, you know, everybody is united. You see what's happening in Europe right now. Um, you know, NATO is behind Ukraine. Uh, the European Union is behind. Uh, I think it's just a question of time. We will bring peace to the country. And, of course, Ukraine is bringing the peace. You're fighting, Absolutely. you know, incredibly, yeah. and everybody, you know, supporting you. And, and uh, that's, that's the most incredible part of the story where we're going to discuss with our esteemed guests on the panel. Uh, we're going to be discussing not the war, uh, not the bravery of our men and women and the military of Ukraine. They're doing a fantastic job, which is uh, it's an admiration of the around the world today. Uh, we're going to be talking about economic redevelopment. Uh, what can we do now uh, during the war? Uh, to make sure that we can provide as much help as needed uh, to the economy of Ukraine, yet at the same time start building foundation for what's going to happen after the war and how we can rebuild the war. And that's the key to conversation today. So that's something that we are very much looking forward to discussing with our panelists. Hopefully they will join us. Uh, uh, Sergey is in Ukraine right now, uh, and he's uh, about to log in, as well as uh, Alex uh, Gordian, as well as Ilya Panamaryov. So we have a great panel coming up. Yeah, absolutely, Henry. And um, I think you mentioned um, exactly the right point. We have to focus on rebuilding the country. Of course, first the war has to be won, but then we have to think about um, building back what was destroyed, uh, the whole devastation in the country, what uh, the Russian army left. And we will need a lot of money. And it shouldn't be just, you know, donations and, you know, giving money, but it should be investment. Uh, because I believe Ukraine is a fantastic uh, investment destination as well. But first, we have to rebuild infrastructure, you know, all the destroyed buildings, uh, the train stations, the airports, the schools, the nurseries, everything, right? That's a, it's a prime target. Uh, it, it's, it's key. The infrastructure is so badly damaged now. Uh, but only so just, just now, before harasses, before we started here, I had a, a presentation I did for of Ukrainians uh, and his Sergey. Good morning, Sergey. Uh, over 100. And- Poltava region discussing uh, rebuilding the ground up. It presents enormous opportunity for the country uh, in order to, for the country to rebuild with the latest technologies, with the best practices from the world of sustainability, of uh, energy management and the resources. So all of that is an opportunity now. And as our military, our brave men and women are winning and pushing the Russians from the Ukrainian soil, we are now have to start on what we can do today. We can now start working on rebuilding Ukraine. And Sergey, welcome uh, to the panel. Uh, Sergey, uh, uh, he is obviously a great, someone who knows a lot about Ukraine's economy, someone who has done a fantastic job over the last two years as a head of an uh, Ukraine Invest Agency, which is uh, basically co- uh, country's agency promoting investment in Ukraine. And he's done a tremendous job. Sergey, welcome. Thank you, Henry. Thank you for inviting today. Thank you. So, Sergey, I'm going to start. And it's great that you are first of our uh, panelists. And because obviously you and I have known each other since you took that position, roughly, and you have done a fantastic job of bringing Ukraine image of investment opportunity to the world prior to the war. But my first question to you now, if you can give our audience, a global audience, an opportunity to understand what is a small, and again, I repeat, small and medium-sized business of Ukraine I experienced today during the war. Thank you, Henry. Um, so, as all of you know, we have war in Ukraine, and the war affects everyone. And as me, it's a key representative of uh, economy of Ukraine. It's a backbone of every economy. So, uh, SMEs are affected seriously. I will give you some numbers about general effect on yes. Ukraine economy and infrastructure. More than 23,000 kilometers of roads were destroyed or affected by the aggression. 32 million square meters of real estate uh, were damaged, destroyed or seized. At least 500, uh, 535 kindergartens, 866 educational institutions, 231 medical institutions, 173 factories, 
and enterprises also were damaged or, or ceased activities to some extent due to the war. Also, 75 administrative buildings in Ukraine were damaged, 277 bridges at least, and we're still counting, 11 military airfields, 17 airports, and two ports, and also uh, four ports are not accessible by uh, by Ukraine. So you can see that Russia uh, is doing a big a big damage to Ukraine, and uh, we need to withstand that aggression not only in terms of political and military defense, but also in terms of economic defense. And it's a very good question, Henry, about SMEs, because as I said, SMEs are the backbone of uh, every any economy. economy that's a driving yeah. engine of any economy yeah so uh what's happening in ukraine we have seen a lot of relocation efforts uh, so some businesses from east of ukraine were trying to relocate to the west of ukraine and uh, ministry of economy received more than 1000 applications you oh. know, for this uh, for this activity more than uh, 400 applications were processed and uh, i think more than 250 companies already operate in different locations uh, at this moment it is hard to estimate the effect on smes what we can see we can see that smes have uh, started to operate more actively compared to march by 25 percent so mm -hmm. this activity is going up because economy it's a life uh, i mean uh, body you know and economy will always survive uh, to and will always cope with all conditions that uh, exist in the country we hope that conditions will become better yeah but still we can see that smes are picking up but they will need a lot of support and government provides a lot of support specifically for smes in agriculture in other sectors so now there are um, uh, non-interest credits that are available for businesses for up to uh, two million dollars approximately yep. wow. That's uh, for, the, for, for the time of the war uh, also there will be uh, tax cuts there will be a special program that will cut tax for special groups of entrepreneurs to up to two percent uh, only two percent tax and the uh, state is working on, on, on other um, incentives in order to promote specifically SME sector this is very important uh, during sewing works in Ukraine, yep. uh, because uh, Ukraine, as you know, is a famous agricultural exporter, uh, a global exporter. Well, we hear about the news about hunger in the world due to war, due to Russian aggression, and how it's prohibiting uh, for Ukrainians yeah. uh, uh, to obviously do a lot of uh, field work right now. According to United Nations, uh, the number of people in hunger will increase from 44 uh, million yeah. to 57 at least. You know, and that's, so, and that's I think this is the beginning of that supply chain that uh, the rest of the world will be hit with very high prices, uh, obviously, due to that. But what I want to talk about today, and Sergey, thank you for that overview of the business in Ukraine and environment. Uh, it is obviously something that every entrepreneur is being taught in one on one is to learn how to adapt, you know, to survive, right? Uh, in just in terms of regular business. Uh, being doing the operating in the war is obviously to take it to the whole different level. So a lot of supply chain, a lot of relationships are being broken, uh, you know, just in the relocation is critical, not only within Ukraine, but also outside Ukraine, because what we want to discuss with you now, and I want to present this to you, is I want to talk about the big numbers, and let's come back from the big numbers and mm -hmm. come back into how do we implement that. We clearly see which uh, governments and many financial institutions around the world are discussing uh, what is called the Ukraine's Marshall Plan, referring to the Marshall Plan after World War II, which is going to be uh, uh, over at least trillion dollars because the damage is already estimated at about seven hundred million. Uh, I'm sorry, seven hundred billion dollars to Ukraine's infrastructure. What we are now having an opportunity after the war, which will come very soon, is to really reimagine the country and is to reimagine how the country is being built bottom up. So please discuss what is Invest Ukraine, uh, Ukraine Invest, I'm sorry, directly will be working. How would you position the agency to work with big, large uh, foundations, different agencies around the world to process that capital and distribute it across the country? Uh, very good question. Uh, well, rebuilding of Ukraine will be a very complex and comprehensive uh, process. There will be multiple parties that will be involved. 
uh, and I mean like states, partner countries, international donors, international financial organizations, international organizations and um, uh, development agencies and, and so on. And there will be also a private sector. Uh, so I uh, think that our primary role is to focus on engagement of private sector in rebuilding of Ukraine's economy. It will be a very interesting process. Not an easy one, because private investor is always in um, uh, always uh, wants to make sure that the, there are profits uh, received and some some returns, obviously. And uh, private investor not only wants to see his well, kind of return of his money, but also of some interest and profits. Um, and if we compare that this uh, investment to state support, it's a very different um, approach. So. Private investor will be when private investor will enter Ukraine, so there will be a good signal that we are doing it uh, right way. So how can we make sure that private investor will enter Ukraine from our point of view? Ukraine has done a lot in terms of development of regulatory policy in 20, 20, 2020 and 2021. And we had uh, new laws introduced like state support for investment projects with yep. significant investments, for example, the so-called yep. investment nanny's law. Yeah, you will get uh, of that, yeah. yeah, but the question is whether this will be enough in this condition. Uh, well, in, in my view, the war. right, because uh, I am having discussions with investors daily now. The yeah. interest is extremely high, and yeah. uh, because I think the Ukraine's biggest asset now, which must be protected at all costs, from my point of view, it's its newly acquired image and reputation around the world. As you know, in investment community, it's critical. The trust, you and I talked about a lot about the trust. And I think the role of the agency that and everything you position is to bring that trust to into Ukraine uh, for the private and many other sources of capital. So uh, let me just get back to the last yeah, question. Please. I just want to finalize that. So um, uh, did, there were, well, significant shifts in regulatory policy in terms of attraction of investments in 20, 2020, 2021. Yes. And then the war, uh, well, uh, obviously affected all this uh, situation. So now we have to adapt uh, to new circumstances. And as I said, we have investment, investment incentives law, but now we need, also need to think about investment insurance and access to finance. Because finance in Ukraine will be uh, critical uh, and we need to make sure that the cost of this finance will be acceptable for investors. I'm sure that investors will be uh, happy to do kind of an emotional investment and invest with a lower return rate as yep. usual, as well as they would expect usually. But still, they need to see that their money will be protected. So we are working now with different governments and institutions uh, throughout the world in order to introduce insurance programs for private investments and access to finance. So I think this will be two important additions to regulatory Absolutely. policy in Ukraine that was developed before the war. So it should be um, a combination of that. Uh, yes, and your question was? Uh, but, but it wasn't more a question, it was more of a statement in, in support of what you have said. Uh, and I wanted to switch now to uh, the importance of the decentralization that the, uh, was taking mm -hmm. place prior to the war, uh, because that's clearly uh, going to impact economic uh, diversity of the country, economic growth of the country, and yet opportunities for many companies, uh, international, I'm speaking, to deal directly with the local governments. Uh, and th that presents additional challenges, but also big opportunities in my view. So please talk about, explain to our viewers and uh, audience about what is decentralization means uh, for them and for Ukraine as a whole. Uh, yes, you, you said that Ukraine is a popular uh country as a popular brand right now yes and we prove that we can defend ourselves and at the same time it builds rebuilds trust and Correct. shows trust as well um uh, increases trust from investors because investors will uh well will be certain that ukrainians will, will not only protect their land but also uh, investments of uh, foreign partners mm -hmm. and yes. We, we have to build on that. We have to build on that new uh, image of Ukraine. But, well, it's not new for us because we always knew 
that uh, yeah. we will protect uh, ourselves. Well, that was your mission. But remember, let's be honest, Ukraine's reputation for, for 30 years have not been the best place in the world to do business in, in terms of corruption and other things. And we have to be honest and open about it because technologies of today and your work of your agency is forcing the economy to change. This shock to the economy will allow us to build everything up fully transparent to every stakeholder not just investor, but the stakeholder. So yes. let's come back to decentralization because I think that's what's critical because that's going to be the driver, in my view, of the economic growth across the country because of decentralization. Decentralization was uh, going, was well taking place in Ukraine for several years right yes. now and it was uh, finalized a year ago. But uh, we're talking about reform. And when reform takes place, then uh, the country needs some time to uh, to adapt to this reform and yeah. to act accordingly. And this is what's happening now, because we have seen more active governors of Ukraine, mayors of Ukraine, and uh, heads of regional authorities, because now they are more responsible for their own budgets to, to, to build a uh, regional economy by themselves as well, with support of central authorities, of course, but with yeah. more independence. So uh, that brought some kind of, uh, I would say, a more adult behavior to the regions, economic behavior, because now they understand that they're responsible for themselves. I have spent last year it's going a through... technological change for them, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it was a real mental change because now they, uh, before they were complaining about central kind of on um, uh, maybe... They were depending on the central money. That, that's it. Now they have to depend yes. on themselves. That's a big uh, change. For they're more them. dependent, de dependent now on their own activities, on their own, uh, well, things they do. Yep. And they are more keen now to talk about long-term investment because before they were more interested in short-term investment in order to show uh, local people or electorate, you know, that they can do some kind of tactical action. Yeah. But now they're interested in strategic action because this is not only about PR and campaigns, this is about real economic life of the region. And I can tell you that we have very good regions they really want to develop. And I'm sure that, unfortunately, not for the best reason because of the war, uh, but Ukraine is popular right now again throughout the world. And we will make sure that this time we will use this opportunity and we'll bring investors to Ukraine. And it's a very good combination of uh, circumstances that has mm -hmm. taken place. So rightly, you said about decentralization. I mentioned regulatory developments. Also, we have since 2019, new president, new government that was reappointed later, but still with some new vision and new abilities and will to develop to develop Ukraine. And also we have the biggest, um, I would say, resource of Ukraine, Ukrainian people and Ukrainian talents, because that is the key for every country to succeed. Our people... Uh, for well, another uh, had another opportunity to prove to prove themselves as people that, as I said, happy to uh, always ready to protect their own land, and people that are our guests or stay with us or cooperate with us. So that that's key. And apart from them, we have many uh, benefits like natural resources. We have twenty out of thirty critical raw uh, materials in Ukraine. We are one of the biggest supplier of agri products uh, throughout the world. Oh, yes. We supply more than about 50% of global uh, sunflower oil uh, to, to the global market, you know. So, and uh, we are strong in terms of metals and uh, many, many, many opportunities. But as I said, the biggest resource of Ukraine are Ukrainian people. Uh, 100%, but the, you also touched on import-export. We see a lot of countries now are dropping the, exp, uh, the, the, the tariffs with Ukraine. So can you address that? How is it important for our small, medium guys, our uh, importers-exporters? Uh, what's happening right now? Yes, and uh, hopefully they will stay that uh, tariff-free type of activity across many different uh, uh, countries. Yeah, it's a, it's a big problem what's happening right now in terms of logistics because it's, uh, well, well, when you produce goods or when you buy goods, you always need to deliver them so, uh, somehow. A big problem for agriculture exports, but what we have seen that the world is waking up uh, finally yes. uh, and paying attention more to this issue because I was um, 
talking about this uh, back in March, I think, and all our colleagues in government as well, they were bringing attention that the war will have consequences on logistic chains and there will be consequence, consequences not only for Ukraine, but for the region and for the whole world. So we have seen statements by uh, G7 countries that will now be ready to send even ships and trucks yes. in order to make sure that logistics will be uh, restored. So I'm sure that this is a temporary issue, but it has to be restored quick. So we have a fact even in Ukraine uh, in terms of uh, petrol and diesel, you know, it's uh, gas stations, uh, you can see long queues, you know, it's, it's also connected to that, you know, so, so many things that affects uh, business. Inside yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all connected today. And that leads me to the next question. We've seen thousands of companies, international companies leaving Russia uh, and basically saying we're not going to do business in the country that is uh, does what it does. So in, uh, as a somebody who's an entrepreneur, uh, obviously I see the opportunity. What can we do as a country now uh, to maybe attract those companies to set up shop in Ukraine? A lot of them are already in Ukraine, uh, but we, obviously they can expand and that's what we want. More than 1,000 companies said that they will stop business fully or to some extent in Russia. And uh, what we are interested in, well, within these figures as Ukraine Invest, we're interested in those who stopped investment plans. And we identified 144 companies that uh, declared kind of uh, the full stop of their investment activities in uh, Russia or full investment plans. So all these companies are receiving letters from Ukrainian government. Uh, we are uh, doing this according to Prime Ministers of Ukraine uh, letters sent, sent to us. And we will be working with every one of them on a kind of tailored, bespoke uh, basis sure. in order to present Ukraine and say that you can enter Ukraine and you can, uh, well, you'll be given land on preferential rates as big investor and you will be able to get also tax cuts and hopefully insurance for your private investment and so on. So we are working on that. Right. And I hope that we'll be able to bring those big brands to, uh, to Ukraine soon. Also, what is important? Um, it is important to remember that Ukraine uh, is a supplier of goods to many international brands like, I don't know, like IKEA, Heinz, uh, you know, you name it, you know, be big brands, more than 100 uh, companies yeah. from Fortune 500 uh, located their R and D, so cooperate with Ukrainian R and Ds. You know, so you can. Always... My point is, those companies already made big statement. I mean, they lost billions in cases, right? So uh, you know, obviously, we want them to use that motivation and earn that back. But now in Ukraine, and we basically want to figure out the way to bring whatever they lost back to them, but on Ukrainian soil creating jobs for local economies, and that's what we want to see. Sergey, thank you for a great start uh, to this panel. Uh, I understand that our uh, speaker... One, our... One more comment from me, if I may. Just oh, yeah, no, we'll come back to you many times. Yeah, just on this, on this very same topic. So it is very important to do business with Ukraine uh, because we have seen that 52% of, uh, of uh, contracts were cancelled with Ukrainian companies yes. due to the war. So if... International brand can still buy from from Ukraine. Please do buy from Ukraine. And also, in addition to sanctions that are imposed on Russia, I think business can impose their own sanctions. Do and not do. buy from Russia, buy from Ukraine. There are goods that are produced in Ukraine, so you can buy those. If they are not produced in Ukraine, we can do a joint investment plant, a plan, build a plant, and then sell to uh, world suppliers. Absolutely. So the, the idea is we want to be able to create those joint ventures of many different types. And this is what brings me to my next speaker, Alex Gordon. Alex, can you hear us? Alex? Alex Gordon. Uh, so, and Alex already, uh, thank you, sir. I'll come back to you because Alex, I think, having a, a difficult time of um, uh, getting uh, in touch with us. Let me see if uh, Alex, oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, Alex, can you hear us? Alex? Yes. Oh, here you go. Yes. Oh, finally, finally. Here's New York. Sorry. So, uh, and uh, Alex, good to see you, my friend. And uh, thank you very much for joining. This is critical time. And I want to jump in right away. First of all and foremost, I want to let everyone know that you are the founder uh, behind Rebuilding uh, Ukraine Agency, uh, which is uh, designed for rapid response. And obviously, you heard what Sergey had said. 
And I please like you, I'd like you to address what is agency doing and how can we connect what is Sergey and his team doing in Ukraine with what your agency, which I'm proud to be part of, doing as well right now. Uh, thank you, Henry. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, Sergey, good to see you. And um, what we have done, we our group has worked in Ukraine for the last 30 years. Uh, we are a private group uh, focused on bringing investment and financing to Ukraine uh, in several different segments. And as the war unfolded, and uh, once we saw that uh, Ukraine will win and uh, Ukraine will remain independent, we thought that the best way to address the issues that were raised by Sergei is to uh, mobilize private investment, mobilize um, financing and services, which we know will certainly be needed in Ukraine as it rebuilds. So we put together an agency which represents now over 50 uh, companies and professionals, primarily US, but also UK, EU, and of course, Ukrainian partners on the ground. Uh, we cover seven or eight segments which are critical, which is construction, uh, construction infrastructure, agriculture, healthcare, and uh, several others. And uh, what we have done, we have been focusing on creating a toolbox, even though we understand that there'll be funding available from donors, there'll be funding probably available from reparations, from uh, Ukrainian government. We think that that may not be absolutely sufficient, and some of that funding takes long a long time. So what we have done, we have put together a toolbox of uh, the tools which, with which we are fluent. Uh, that's uh, inter financing from international financial institutions, expert credit agencies, as well as um, risk management, uh, um, risk management and private, uh, private equity and uh, capital markets financing. Those are the tools that which we have used in Ukraine. And we think that these tools will be, will be very useful going forward. Excellent. So, uh, by the way, all of our guests who are listening, please uh, feel free to uh, put the questions into the chat or click uh, on the mic so I can see that you want to ask a question, uh, one of our panelists. Uh, but, Alex, coming back to you, you and I have discussed uh, another big idea right now where you and I are obviously on daily conversations discuss, uh, talking to CEOs and executives of world comp uh, world-class companies. And basically asking, what can we do now in order to position us to take advantage of the um, opportunity to help as well as to rebuild the country? And one of the ideas we had is those companies can invest now into helping Ukrainian side, what Sergey is doing, those companies on the ground to prep the projects for you to be financed. So they can invest some of their time, some of their expertise now, very low level of investment, very low risk, yet it gives enormous boost to financeability of the project or the deal. Please speak towards that. That's correct. There are several tools which are available, and I, start, I will start with the tool that Sergey mentioned, the insurance. There is political insurance available to the investors from the U.S. companies as well as the local investors who will invest. There is U.S. government political insurance available, and uh, we can process the applications now for the investment. So that's very good news from what I, from where I said, because political insurance today is the key factor for investability, protecting the investors and also giving the, uh, the lenders comfort in, the, uh, in the financing the project. And uh, what we have been doing, we have uh, been looking out uh, to develop grant funding as well as uh, companies uh, like members of our agency who are contributing uh, right now pro bono services to help prep screen and prep projects in some cities as well in certain uh, key verticals like construction supply equipment so to give you an example we are working with uh, several cities which were bombed uh, to uh, and exploring ways in which uh, our members can provide engineering services today uh, at no cost to the cities so to help them uh, develop their plans Alex, I want to stop you here because there's nothing to hide in my view. Uh, Sergey, because we are already on the call, we are talking about uh, developing uh, infrastructure, that's engineering firm Alex referring to, for uh, the Gastomir, Bucha, Irpeng, uh, uh, in the regional hub right there. And that firm that Alex is referring to is very interested in being part of this redevelopment. 
what should these companies do? How should they work with your agency to get this off the ground with minimum bureaucracy and full transparency? It's a large US engineering firm. Well, well, it depends how they want to support. They want they they have their own funds to enter Ukraine and to do project, or they want to do the work and to get financed by Ukraine or by international program. So we always need to get a detailed request. So I suggest uh, they contact us or they contact through you and uh, give us a detailed request what they have envisaged in terms of helping Ukraine, and then we will navigate from there. So okay, so one of the key problems. things I'm going to be interrupting because it's getting very interesting. The key is yeah. what we do doing now. We have three uh, entity or two, sorry, two entities right now: Rebuilding Ukraine Agency, which takes charge globally for three things: financial capital, strategic partnerships, meaning companies like we just mentioned, and legal, which is critically, as you know, important and everything that relates to that. Uh, and you are already doing it on the ground, obviously in Ukraine. And what we want to do is to connect so it works efficiently and transparently and with minimal risk to our investors who we all invite to come to Ukraine. So, Alex, question to you. If from your point of view, what do you need from the government of Ukraine at national level and, and maybe at the local level? We should address it. What are, how do you want to see those projects presented to you? Well, at this point, we understand that there is a war going on. We try to minimize our... Uh, interaction with the government, not to not to suck away their resources, not to drain away the resources from uh, from them. But essentially, what we need to do, we need them to be aware of what's going on. We'd like them to observe. So we are absolutely willing, and this is what we do both with the U.S. government, uh, with the other expert credit agencies, and with the Ukrainian uh, relevant institutions. We like to keep them in the loop. So they know what's going on. So we don't have when we need to start working together closely. We don't need to have a long time of explaining what's happening. So at this point, that's what we need. And we need the support from the mayors and from the government if we are applying for any government grants, because there are government grant programs available today for Ukraine uh, in several verticals and several segments. They're significant. They would provide for feasibility study preparation, uh, project development costs, and those uh, applications which we would develop in-house would require support letters from the government, uh, understanding that that's going on and supporting this project. So those are the two things at this point that are needed. There is nothing more for them. Thank you, Alex. And uh, uh, Sergey, obviously, uh, this is what agency is designed to do, more or less, right? On a, a national level, that's what you're already doing. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, we anticipate there's going to be a great support from Ukrainian government uh, and uh, that is going to be provided to those type of partners coming in, not just to protecting capital, but allowing them to faster integrate their operations in Ukraine. So to speak towards the what is national government preparing right now? Uh, you mentioned some programs, but let's talk about larger money. We're talking about grant building, city building. Uh, we see President Zelensky talks about different countries responsible for rebuilding of different cities. Uh, so how that is, from government point of view, is being seen now? Well, there is a group of uh, advisory group in government that works with the Office of the President as well So uh, on, on rebuilding of Ukraine. And as President Zelensky said, it's important to start work now, but on critical infrastructure. So I'm sure that um, we are far uh, at the moment from having some kind of final uh, strategy in terms of rebuilding the whole Ukraine. So we need to stabilize the economy. We need to rebuild critical infrastructure. But what will be happening later, um, it will take uh, time and resource, you know, to in order to identify uh, that. So it's an ongoing process. And we're happy to see that international uh, community, you know, brings up uh, initiatives like like yours. Mm -hmm. uh, but there will be a need for coordination with Ukrainian government, obviously, in order to, you know, see how this cooperation will move forward. Excellent. And Alex, that leads me to the next question to you. You, in many statements that you and the conversation you and I had together, you have mentioned Ukraine became financeable now 
uh, and t- please explain what that means versus uh, where Ukraine today and, pre- and prior to the war. Uh, it's it's not a simple question because financeable is different. There is a desire, of course, uh, on on the part of the international financial community to finance Ukraine. Uh, most of that will come once the war is contained. Uh, whether it's may it may not be over, but it needs to be contained in a way that does not present risks to the areas being financed. Uh, there is a uh, probably will be an expedited form of processing of any request because usually international financing is an involved process, whether it involves credit ratings from bond agencies or due diligence from the government uh, uh, agencies or the international financial institutions. I expect it to be faster. I expect terms to be uh, probably a little bit more lenient, the financing terms. However, what on the flip side, we do not know what the uh, financial statements will look like of the potential borrowers if these are credits, or what the budgets of the cities will look like, and I suspect not very well. So it will be a balancing act which would require uh, financing on the equity side, uh, instruments like insurance will be huge. As I said, the political risk insurance or breach of contract insurance would be huge to help the equity coming to the end of the country. So talking uh, and coming back to you, Sergey, talking about risk management, and that's a critical part of any investment. And obviously, uh, in Ukraine is as good as anywhere else. The point I wanted to make is what Alex is coming to is the risk insurance. What can government of Ukraine, you mentioned early in the conversation, that you're working on now on the products to provide that risk insurance, right? Uh, And that's exciting. So, and obviously, Alex already has an expertise of what those risk policies or risk insurance type should look like in real life. So, is there opportunity to take some of the best practices in the world and implement them through uh, Ukraine Invest into the uh, uh, opportunity Ukraine, as they call it? Ukraine Invest is not uh, Ministry of Economy of Ukraine, yes, and yes. we don't have any executive, like kind of, uh, well, governmental powers. Uh, we are more. Yeah, but you're the driver. Uh, don't emotional. Don't well, not only us; we're just part of the driving yes. force. You know, so I wouldn't say that we are the only uh, driving force in terms of investments. We have oh, very okay. strong economic teams in government, and uh, in terms of risk management, yes, there will be different approaches. Uh, Ukraine has showed that um, uh, we are able to protect businesses when needed because if you remember at the beginning of the war, there was crisis with planes and Ukraine established uh, insurance fund for Ukrainian um, uh, airlines, uh, airline companies uh, in order for them to be able to use international fleet, you know, because they need to use insurance. So, and I'm sure that Ukraine will be able to come up with something similar. But this will depend a lot on, uh, well, amount of budget of Ukraine at the time yeah. uh, when the war ends or maybe before the war, if there will be such decision. Uh, so that's one part, uh, Ukrainian risk management strategy. But the other part that can be uh, worked out probably right away is international uh, risk management programs. Uh, and here we talk about PRI or war insurance, uh, which is a bit different to PRI and can be applied as well uh, from expert agencies, from development agencies from throughout the world. And I have spoken to one of the EU ambassadors and we have been uh, talking about this possibility, how to obtain this possibility in EU. And one of the ideas that came to our mind was to... Um, Evaluate how much of investments from that specific EU country currently in Ukraine mm-hmm. and say $500 million or $1 yeah. billion dollars, to double it up and introduce a bilateral insurance program from that country in order to cover existing in- investments and also uh, in- uh, provide incentives for new ones to come from that country and invest in Ukraine. You know, so um, and um, the U.S. is very strong in terms of <coughs> BRI or war insurance, uh, DFC, MIGA, well, that's international thing. 
uh, you know, so many options on the table. So it should so, be correct. That's my, my, my point being is that I believe that rebuilding Ukraine agency is what's going to be the hub that's going to pull all of them together and use them as needed, depending on the project, because all of them require different, uh, mostly, type of insurances. So, uh, I don't think that private agency will be able to build this up. Uh, there is a definitely need to avoid government, involvement. government here yes. because all agencies will seek uh, some kind of state uh, support for activity. So I urge you to, and well, anyone, uh, thank you for initiative, but um, do please get in touch with government because coordination mm -hmm. is key. Uh, you may be doing a very good thing, but in order to make it more effective, it's better to coordinate straight away, you know, and talk about what's happening right now. Uh, thank you, Sergey. Alex, last word to you for about uh, 30 seconds to 45 seconds. Well, very much agree with Sergey. This is going to take a huge cooperation between the government, the private sector, mm -hmm. the NGOs. Uh, what we think right now, the most important activity from our standpoint is to prepare is to gather the resources, to, to have everything available in order to and uh, monitor the, because the situation is very fluid, it changes every day. It's very important to monitor what's happening and it's very important to pick, the, to sort through what I see the mirage because we're seeing a lot of projects which I call uh, white noise. A lot of people want to, everybody wants to on an emotional level to do things. I've seen more projects for glass plants uh, sitting here in New Jersey in the last two months that I've seen, you know, over the last 30 years. So, and uh, maybe one of them will get done out of 20. So it's very important right now to do things which can be done. And as I said, this is preparation. This is building of the resources. This is relationship building with potential between the potential stakeholders, whether it's governments or municipalities or private enterprises, and essentially keeping everybody appraised of the capabilities of abilities. So when things do come down, one can not one doesn't have to waste time and can move straight away into the execution phase. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Sergey, last word to you. Yeah, uh, maybe. Just uh, thank you for organizing this and for organizing this platform. And I think that your platform is important because it also consolidates. Because uh, if I'm not mistaken, you said that more, more than 50 businesses already signed up to Correct. participate. Correct. So again, yeah, this is By about, the way, we invite everybody on this call and this uh, agenda yeah. to participate and uh, reach so out. It's about consolidation because so many businesses want to support Ukraine. But if they will come in person or one by one, it will be... Uh, Taxing the resources, to all of taxing the resources, it's fit negotiations yeah. instead of one. This is one of the reasons we did this because we picked the experienced teams, which have experience, most of them have experience working in Ukraine previously. But we understand that right now the resources of the government are precious and need to be conserved. So having 50 yeah. negotiations is not the way to do this. So thank you for your thank initiative you. and I wish you a very good luck. And, and anyone who also consolidates business, they can get in touch with the government of Ukraine. We'll be happy to uh, support. And I, I want well to thank you both. As well as other organizations. By the way, I want to thank you both. And I know that uh, Frank already, uh, our founder of Horasis, Dr. Richter, already committed to be hold a physical Horasis meeting uh, as we did in, back in 2018 in Kyiv after the war. So I want to thank everybody. I also want to mention to everyone, and I'll put in the chat, uh, with the students of Ukraine, we launched a program to support small and medium-sized businesses of Ukraine. Uh, and it's called website United Students of Ukraine. We're basically getting working capital to small businesses of Ukraine. And the only thing they need to do is to give that service or goods for free to the people on the ground and provide a video of support of that. That's it. We are building trust with the small steps. And when we give out our first 800 loaves of bread, I felt really, really good about that very small contribution that we can make today. And that's, by the way, by the students of Ukraine. So I want to thank you for a great discussion, valuable discussion, critical for the future of Ukraine. We already start working, and we urge everyone to get join us and contribute in any way you can. Thank you all. Slava Ukraini. And happy Vyshevanka Day. Yes, Thank yes, you. I don't have. Yes, <laughs> happy Wishwanka Day for sure. Thank you very much. Thank Talk you. to you soon, everybody. Thank you, bye -bye. everybody. Good seeing you. Bye -bye.